Good morning. <laughs> I will never for the life of me understand why the, you know you everybody crams into that one into the bed to the back pew rather than the the, the front <laughs> and then gets all the space she wants to and then lie down in the chair so the rest of you are all muscle in there. I mean, how do I mean, you've got a huddle for warmth in the winter, but what's your excuse in the, in the summer? Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who participated in the fashion show yesterday. We had an amazing afternoon. If you, if you weren't here, uh, we had about 130 people here, uh, including, including the models, uh, who had put on an amazing afternoon and uh, ate angel food cake until well, we we're eating food cake again today. Um, as a result, it's, it's such a great way to connect with our community, and the, the results are so far beyond uh, beyond what simply uh, can be measured. Uh, and the impact it makes in, in partnering with the community and in, in, in engaging uh, with people who might not otherwise darken the doors of the church are innumerable. Uh, that being said, it also helped, it also raised almost $1,000 this year. Which is awesome. And so thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you to everyone who and to us. <laughs> While you're in a clapping mood, uh, I want to invite all of it is Mother's Day, and Beth reminded me that it was four years ago today uh, that I first set foot in this church. Um, Mother's Day and, and me and this church has a have a special connection. Uh, and so I want to invite all the moms who are here today uh, to stand up if you would and if you're able. Uh, and I want to, uh, I want the rest of us to just take a moment to honor the moms for Thank you all for being such a great moment. It's hard on days like this where Beth and I are so far away from our family, and it's so nice that we have, uh, <laughs> I have, I've inherited, and I've told my grandmother, I've inherited a number of grandmothers and mothers. <laughs> Fortunately, she's not competitive, though. Just a couple of announcements to bring to everyone's attention. Um, as a follow-up to our annual meeting conversation, uh, we're actually going to be filming the whole service today. Uh, one of the practices that we were encouraged to do uh, by, by mentors of mine was to bring in uh, what's called mystery worshipers, people who would normally not participate in the service to come in and experience church uh, with, with, uh, with our faith family and, and give us their, their honest feedback as outsiders. Um, that doesn't work so well in Renfell where uh, A, we know everyone, and B, our, our, they, if you're a visitor, you kind of stand out in our, in our little faith family. Uh, and so we're doing a modern take on an old idea, and we're going to film the whole service, and we're going to uh, distribute it to a few um, mystery worshippers who are going to give us their feedback on the service. So, uh, know that you are being filmed today, and every, uh, everyone will see you fidget, and, and everyone will know who sleeps through the service. <laughs> uh, a couple of other announcements, though. At the back on the table, are some postcards. Our, uh, our promotional materials for our summer VBS uh, have arrived and they look amazing. Uh, if you don't know, if you haven't seen the announcement, uh, we're going to be running a vacation Bible school here at the church from August 10th to 14th. Uh, there's a team from Saskatoon coming to do the, the majority of the legwork uh, and they're, they're very excited and they're, they're, they're uh, leading the charge in, in doing youth ministry across the Synod. Um, but our responsibility is to get these postcards in hand to as many people as possible. So if you want to take a handful, I've got more in my office, so if the stack at the back runs out, so much the better. Uh, take a few of these, distribute them to any young families, even if they're not from Grenfell, if they live in Wolseley or Broadview or Indian Head or anywhere that's drivable, even Melville, uh, people will, uh, it gives people an excuse to spend a great week in our awesome town. Um, this afternoon, 
We are going to be joining with our friends and our extended faith family, of course, again at the Pioneer Home. And so if you are uh, if you are around this afternoon and you are not busy getting seed in the ground, mm -hmm. we would love to have you join us for a time of prayer and worship. Um, like I say every time, it's always a great opportunity to remind ourselves and remind the folks at the Pioneer Home that church isn't a building. Church is wherever the people of God get together to worship God, and that's what we're doing, uh, and that's what we will be doing this afternoon. So I, I hope that you will attend. Um, <coughs> and if that's not your, if that's not your bag, uh, on the 14th this Thursday we're going to be having a gym night at the high school. Uh, so if you don't want to hang out with old people, come hang out with young people instead. Um, not that the two are mutually exclusive; you can do both. Um, the gym night's always a great, uh, a great evening. Uh, it's a chance to beam kids with dodgeballs. Uh, it's a chance to get your anger out. Jason Urschel in floor hockey. Uh, never go up against Jason Urschel in floor hockey. I've learned. He, he lifts the stick and he plays it dirty. <laughs> but come and chew around, do whatever you want to do. It's it's a great night. It's sort of a free form chance to be with the youth in a youth-friendly environment. Um, the rest of the announcements, you can uh, you can peruse at your leisure. Uh, I encourage you, as always, to take home the bulletin insert. Uh, it's, got our, it's got our weekly prayer requests on it as well, so uh, it's a great way to make sure we're connecting with uh, connecting with our, uh, with our community in not just material needs, but also in spiritual ones. That being said, let's take a moment and let's still our hearts and our minds and let's pray. <clears throat> God of wonder, God of the universe and of the molecules, the big and the small, you Scripture reminds us, are not just all, but in all. And so today, we marvel at this truth. As we gather, we pray that your spirit would begin a transformation in us. That your spirit would move and shape us from a collection of individuals into a community of worshiping. And that your spirit would come and transform the words that we say and the, the songs that we sing into more. That you would come and inhabit the praises of your people. And so, with the words we say and in the songs we sing, in all of it, be glorified, be exalted, and be proclaimed as the God who was and is, and is to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> let's stand this morning and let's worship in song. Uh, the first two songs we're going to sing are Come, Let's Sing the Wonderful Love, and then we'll sing Just As I Am Without One Plea. The words for both are in the songs of the Gospel book, or you can follow along on the screen. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
to say good morning to, and let's uh, greet each other with a fully high Heavenly Father, you call us to a gentle justice. To a justice that extends beyond retribution or an eye for an eye. It challenges us to see the world around us as you see it. As a world that is hurting, separated, but in need of self-sacrificing love. We recognize today that justice is hard. But we thank you that justice is a two-sided coin. 
that if we turn justice over, we see it for what it really is, true, perfect righteousness. The people of God living like the people of God. And so we hear today that your call to justice is also a call to righteousness. To see and know and understand that the truth that you call us to live out with our hands and our feet begins in our heart and in our mind. The call to transform our world is the call to be transformed in it, for it, and because of it. So today, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your guidance. We thank you for the person of your Son, for the example of perfect vulnerability. We thank you that he didn't come as a conquering hero. We thank you that he didn't come as a bloodthirsty king. We thank you that from the beginning his story was about vulnerability of the child born in a manger who would grow up homeless, identifying with the poor. Also that this prophecy that a bruised reed he would not break could be fulfilled. And so we thank you that the same is true today. For those who are bruised, whether by violence, emotional abuse, the busyness of a hard week, the exhaustion of life, the injustice of an unjust world. or the simple fact that we all make bad choices. Whatever it is that's bruising us today, we thank you that you are the gentle king, that you are the gentle Messiah. And so too, we pray forgiveness for ourselves. As we've been forgiven, it's so easy to turn to the world that seems so repeatedly broken and snap it, break it, and be done with it. We look at stories of persecution, of murder around the world, of violence and terror, and we respond with anger, we respond out of fear, we respond with power and aggression. And the call of Jesus challenges us to see that the world is not broken, but bruised. That we're not to be done with the world, but we're called to redeem it. Forgive us for the times when we've been less like Jesus and more like ourselves. Forgive us for the times that we've broken <clears throat> even though we've been spared. Father, today, we give you back the world that already belongs to you. And ask that you would give us the strength to be gentle, the courage to be vulnerable, and the patience to be the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our God is faithful. Faithful to forgive, faithful to pursue <coughs> grace with reckless vulnerability. Faithful to die on the cross once and to live forever. Let's sing of his faithfulness this morning. The great old hymn, Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, in mercy we see. Number 85 in the world.
I invite you to join with me in the printed words. Uh, if you have a worship guide, they're printed in there, and they are up on the screen in a moment as well. Let us confess our faith together. We are called to work out the meaning of our own lives and to find our true vocation in the love and service of God. We serve and love God by the service and love of creation, especially in the care of the need. And every kind of work that is lost and serves others is a vocation from the Lord. Calling means the necessity to deny selfish attention and desire in order to minister to others. In God's service, true freedom is to be found. I love that last one. In God's service, true freedom is to be found. <clears throat> I'm a big believer that words are important. And it doesn't say that true freedom, in God's service, true freedom is found. It's got the, the perfect tense of, of the verb for all the grammar Nazis out there. There's a, To be found is true freedom. To be found in God's service is where true freedom lies. I love the way that sounds. I love the truth that's buried in there. In God's service, true freedom is to be found. As the choir, before we, as the choir prepares to minister to us through music, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward at this time. We give back to God His time and our offering. <coughs> Thank you. 
writers for that nature of music, and as always, thank you, Geraldine, for your leadership. Over the last few weeks, uh, we've been leaping through the book of Acts. Um, it wasn't really intentional, it sort of happened that way. But as I've been reading through the book back at the head of the messages, um, the thing that really struck me about Acts was how much the church does. And it's not, to me, Acts gives a perfect picture, and I think that's what the book is designed to do, gives a perfect picture for what the church's calling in life is to be. Uh, you see the church's mission leap off the pages. Uh, and I think my goal in this, in this series is to help us do the same. That our, our mission shouldn't be about reciting a mission statement and then trying to figure out how to make that fit into life. Our mission should flow out of the way we live and move and have our people. That's why I've called this, this series uh, Riot Gear. Riot being an acronym for reaching in and out together. Um, and hopefully, so hopefully the Book of Acts will, will equip us and clothe us to do that good work. So I'm going to read from the fourth chapter of Acts this morning. Starting to read at verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were landowners or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds for what was sold, and laid it at the, at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it to the apostles' feet. And Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, it did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him outside and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. Then the young man came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church, and upon all who heard of these things. May God add his blessing to this very strange reading from his word. <coughs> Nonetheless, the word of God. Thanks be to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our salvation. It's in you that we pray, and in you that we trust. Amen. You can tell a lot, I think, about a society by the kind of heroes it lifts up. For the ancient Greeks, the heroes like Achilles and Odysseus and Prometheus, the, the big icons of 
classical culture represented the, the virtues of glory and honor and wisdom. Fast forward a decent way, and in the 1920s, as the world was struggling through the, the Great Depression, the heroes that we read about, the heroes that were the most popular were, were detectives like Dick Tracy, who fought against the, the mafia and, and who struggled to root out corruption wherever it was. In the war era, heroes like Captain America and Superman, who embodied the values of patriotism and, and, and propaganda, were ubiquitous. In the 1970s, as social change swept through North America, the heroes became representative of the marginalized. Those on the outside of society, like the X-Men or Spider-Man. But in this 21st century, in an era of rapid change, in an era of uncertainty and fear, our heroes that, that resonate the most are not the Iron Men or the Hulks. As excited as I am to go see the new Avengers movie on Monday. To us, Superman is a relic of a distant era. He doesn't make sense anymore in our, in our culture. And so we, if we want to reinvent Superman, we do it by making him dark and brooding and, and gritty. The only X-Man that, that appeals to our, to our broad sense of culture is Wolverine, the tragic anti-hero. Gone are the days of heroic idealism, and in is the age of the flawed hero, the anti-hero. Like it or not, as a culture, we have been made aware that we are strangely vulnerable. We live in a time when everything is available to us with a few strokes of the keyboard. When your bank account could be wiped out by a hacker. When everything that anybody wants to know about you could be, could be found by swiping the magnetic strip on your health card. When the thing that very well may kill us as a species is an invisible gas that no one can seem to do anything about. Fear seems to linger around every corner. And as technological progress speeds up, fear begins to shine a light more and more on the one thing that we are absolutely terrified of as a species. We are vulnerable. I think that that is the single greatest reason why, in the 21st century, the hero that, that resonates the most with our culture, with our, with, our, with our iconography, with our innate sense of right and wrong, is Batman. Because that's core Batman's story that you all know is a story of vulnerability. An eight-year-old boy watches his parents be gunned down, watches his parents fall victim to the randomness and violence of a broken world. So there's no point of return for him. From where he sits, Batman is the reality, Bruce Wayne is the mask. And so Batman, in a sense, becomes us. His vulnerability mirrors ours. We see ourselves in his own sense of brokenness, and he empowers us, actually, to, to see ourselves in, in the little corners of the universe that we, that we all inhabit, to see our own little piece of Gotham City in, in our own corner of Grenfell and to do everything we can to change it for the better. We look for a hero to make sense of our vulnerability. We look for a hero who can embody that sense of vulnerability and can do something about it. The Superman, the Hulk, the invulnerable, the, this, the, the, iron, the literally iron men don't do that for us. But rather than addressing our vulnerability up in cape and cowl, Today's reading challenges us to do something drastically different. Today's reading actually challenges us to do what Batman does, but in a totally different way. Because after all, no one can argue that the early church knew nothing of vulnerability. This was the early church that, from the, in the beginning of the book of Acts, was huddled together in a small upper room because they were terrified of the fact that, that the authorities were going to burst through the door at a moment's notice and arrest them all, and that their fate would be the same as Jesus's. These were the same apostles who, in, in a few years, are going to be forced to literally worship underground because it would be illegal to do otherwise. 
These are the church who were killed in spectacularly creative ways. This is the church who knew what it was to truly be the vulnerable ones. But instead of doing what Batman does, instead of taking their hands and clenching, clenching them into fists, the church does something remarkable. The church takes those fists and opens them back up and extends their arms. The church embraces vulnerability. I think that for us this means two things. One, that the church opens itself up to those who are the vulnerable. Or two, that the church understands, accepts, and doesn't try to shy away from the fact that it is a collection of vulnerable people. Because it's that second part. That second one is so easy to do, isn't it? We build walls. We build buildings. We build gates and fences, all designed to keep people out. Even in our church architecture, we, 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 we build churches designed to keep people out. We call the entryway a foyer, and that's a fine word for it. But in traditional churches, the entryway of a church is called a narthex, which sounds like a big, funny, fancy Greek word, and it is. And you get a lot of points if you can put it on the scrap board. But the word narthex was a borrowed word. It is actually the outer shell of a fennel root. And if you've ever looked at a fennel root, it has a hard outer shell. And the outer, the outer shell is actually called the narthex. We adopted that, as, and as our church architecture became the, the, the entryway, was, uh, the, the place where the, the, the outside was, was gathered. But everything becomes foreign. And when we use a word that is specifically designed to keep people out from and, and, as, and we institute it as part of our architecture, we can't help but adopt that mentality at least a little bit. Even think about the way you came into this church today. You walk into the church building, and then you have to walk through another area before you can come to the sanctuary. Before you can come to the worship space, you have to go through entryway after entryway after entryway. There are three sets of doors before you can come into the sanctuary to worship. We design buildings at a fundamental level to keep people out. The early church wasn't about buildings. The early church understood this fundamental truth that buildings are designed for the exclusive purpose of keeping some people out. And even if we put a sign out front with big bright lettering that says, everybody welcome, the building's primary function is always to keep people out. The church embraces vulnerability. When I was in high school, as most high school kids are do, I got really into reading, um, and I got really into reading the the great. It sounds like that. I got really into reading the great communist readers, the, the socialists. I was really into. I was a big, big supporter of communism as a high school kid, which doesn't make any sense, but that's it, but that's who I was. Uh, I had my Che Guevara t-shirt, I thought it was all hip and cool, and I wanted to rage against the machine. And I read this passage, and I remember thinking about it, and saying, here it is, plain as day in scripture, in black and white and, and red, that the early church held everything in common. The early church was a socialist, communist utopia. Che Guevara would be proud. But reading this passage and just thinking about money, I think actually misses Luke's point here. Luke says they held all their possessions in common, but then he goes on to say, to reiterate that point by saying they held everything in common. It wasn't just about their money. It was about how they lived their lives. They lived their lives in common. It was about how they worshipped. They worshipped in common. It was about how they belonged. They belonged in common. And in doing so, they actually became a vulnerable community. They, in doing so, they actually embraced vulnerability. Because all of a sudden, they had to trust each other. 
in a way that's not natural and in a way that's hard and, if we're really honest, a little bit scary. Because all of a sudden, in their community, they had to start interpreting Scripture together. All of a sudden, they had to share their fears and their struggles with each other. All of a sudden, they had to pray actually for each other. All of a sudden, they had to give to each other. And for those of you who are keeping score, none of these are fun. None of these are easy. Because if it were up to me, I would love to be the only one who got to interpret Scripture. Because there are things that I'm good at and things I'm not good at. I would like to interpret Scripture and emphasize the things that I'm good at and de-emphasize the things I'm not good at. It, that's if it were up to me, though. If it were up to me, I'd make it as possible, as easy as possible for me to get as close to God as I possibly can. Even if that means leaving you in the lurch. But, as soon as we start interpreting Scripture together as a community, as a faith family, then all of a sudden, your voice and mine carry, both carry weight. And all of a sudden, if I'm putting my life under the authority of Scripture, that means putting my life under your authority a little bit. Not, not, not all the way, but a little bit. And then I think that that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote that we're called to submit to one another. We're called to, to engage in this kind of vulnerable community and, and by putting ourselves under the authority of Scripture and interpreting Scripture together, we actually put ourselves under each other's authority. We, we submit to each other. Or what Paul meant when he wrote to the Philippians, think, let no one think only of themselves, but also of each other. The same is true when we walk into this church and we shake hands and we ask each other, how are you doing today? And everyone's response is, oh, I'm good. I guarantee you not everyone in this room is good today. But we do it because when we walk into church, we're making, we want to make a presentation to the people that are around us. We want to show them that, that whatever the, the image that we want to we want, we want them to perceive. That's how we convey ourselves. That's how we show ourselves. It's like we put on a mask and, and we want to show people that we're cool or that we're confident or that we're, we're comfortable or that we're powerful or that we're successful or that we have it all together when the reality that spins around inside of our head when no one else is watching is that none of those things are true. But how does the church pray for itself? How does the church pray for each other if we don't share in that community of vulnerability? How do we be the church if we can't embrace vulnerability? To really pray in a, with a sense of vulnerability means that we have to take off the mask of presentation and stop trying to pretend that everything's okay. Because it isn't. Church needs to be a place where people can be vulnerable, where the church can embrace vulnerability, where things don't have to be okay all the time, because the reality is that they aren't. One of the best examples of pop culture doing a better job of, of skewering itself is in the show, uh, one of my favorite TV shows, uh, House M.D., um, if it's on Netflix, so go binge watch. Um, it's kind of a modern reinvention of the story of Sherlock Holmes, uh, but instead of solving crimes because that's ridiculous, he uh, solves medical mysteries because that makes more sense. House is kind of a tragic hero. He's a hero for the 21st century. He's a hero uh, who's an anti, who's antisocial, but he, and he's a Viking addict. He is. Uh, proudly proclaims that he's a mess. And the show explores that and uses that as kind of a lens to look at the wider culture. In one, in one particular episode, House, uh, House's girlfriend nearly dies from cancer. And during her hospital stay, he visits her only once and he does so high. After she recovers, she confronts him about his relapse. The conversation goes like this. 
House asks, how did you know? She responds, how could I not know? How could I not let myself forget for months that you're an addict? My subconscious was trying to tell me you could never get through this without drugs. That was a one-time thing. It's not about the pills, House. It's about what they mean. They mean I was scared. I thought my girlfriend might die. No, she says. You don't take Vicodin because you're scared. You take it so you won't feel pain. Everything you've ever done is to avoid pain. The drugs and sarcasm are designed to keep everybody at arm's length so no one can hurt you. Oh right, as opposed to everyone else in the world who goes looking for pain like it's buried treasure. Pain happens when you care, she says. You can't love someone without making yourself open to their problems and their fears. And you are not willing to do that. Pain happens when you care. You can't love someone without making yourself open to their problems and their fears. And you are not willing to do that. How many times could the church have that said about them? The church is good at hiding itself in a million different places and in a million different ways, all designed to make sure that we're never accidentally vulnerable. But this morning's reading isn't just a call to vulnerability. It's also, against, it's also a warning against the dangers of hiding from it. Because that is the fundamental in truth of what Ananias and Sapphira do. Traditional interpretation of this passage was that Ananias and Sapphira were killed because they held back a portion of their offering. But again, I think that that is too narrow an understanding for to, and it misses Luke's point. I think that that kind of assumes that the church is kind of this celestial North Korea that that, that says, you know, you have, you have to give all of this, you have to do this and this and this, and then you can be part of the church. I think if Ananias and Sapphira had brought their, their offering and said, hey, look, this is, what, this is what I have to sell, this, but I have debt, I have creditors, I have people who are coming after me, I have people, I have needs, I have a, a son who can't work, a daughter who, who needs a, a daughter who needs surgery, I simply can't give more than this. I believe with all of my heart and all of my soul that, that if, if Ananias and Sapphira had brought their offering and said, this is my situation, the apostles would have looked at them and said, Take this and then some. Go and minister to your family. Go and be well and be fed. But they don't. I'm sure Ananias and Sapphira were, were supremely practical people. I'm sure they, they measured it all out and said, this is how much we'll sell this land for. This is how much debt we owe. This is how much we need to survive. And then they asked all the questions that we all asked. What if this church thing is just a flash in the pan? Maybe we should hold some back for a rainy day. What if something unexpected happens? What if, what if my house burns down? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? They asked all these questions and then did the, did the basic math and said, we need to hold back this amount. We need to, to hold on to this just in case. Instead of giving the church the opportunity to be the church, they tried to clothe themselves in a, in, a, in a temporary invulnerability. And as much as they were, I'm sure, supremely practical, my only question for them would be, how did that work out for you? Because Ananias and Sapphira show us this perfect illustration, this beautiful picture of exactly what it looks like, exactly what happens if you try to deny the fundamental truth that you and I are vulnerable people. So I want you to join me in just a moment of silence. Just even for a few seconds. Close your eyes and breathe in through your nose and out of your mouth. Breathe in and hear the subtle hiss as your lungs fill with air. 
stop and in silence listen to the rhythmic thump thump, thump thump, thump thump, thump thump of your heart. Breathe in and understand that you're not guaranteed another breath. Stop and listen and know that this could be your last heartbeat. This passage is designed to remind us of the fact, but also to ask us what we're going to do about it. In the grand scheme of things, how much Ananias and Sapphira actually got for their land doesn't matter. How much they gave doesn't matter. Would it really be enough? After all, things could have been gotten really bad. Maybe they should have kept it. But how did that work for them? To me, this passage is a challenge for the church. It's a challenge to return to the roots of our community and be vulnerable. Not just here on Sunday morning, but in our lives and in our work. The church is called and challenged to be a committee and a community of vulnerability. We're called to embrace it, to own it, and to be it. Because I believe that, more than anything else, if we can be an authentically vulnerable community, the community that we are vulnerable in will respond. If we open ourselves up and we approach our world, with our broken, bruised world, with gentle, gracious vulnerability, with hands outstretched, open wide, and ready to embrace the rest of the world who will also admit that they are vulnerable people too, the church can thrive. But it starts with being vulnerable. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to be a vulnerable community. We want to see the poor and the hurting lifted up. We want to see justice roll down from like the mountain. We want to see your love flood this town. Let our love be the spark that ignites a blaze here in Grand Valley and beyond. Today we think about those in a moment of silence who we know are vulnerable. The sick. The grieving. The despair. young, the old, the widow, and the immigrant. We pray for those in our faith family who need prayer. To you, O oh God, we commit them today. To you, O oh God, we lift them up. And to you, O oh God, belong all honor and majesty, authority and power, now and always. In Jesus' name. As we go out then now in service to our community, in service to vulnerability, embracing the broken, let's sing the great old hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, a song for the vulnerable.
creed of the vulnerable church. So now, as you go out into a broken world, go and and the bruised reed do not break, the broken heart do not stir. Go in the community to love and serve God. Go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until he comes again. Amen.